Welcome to my talk about lost in transaction or how to get, avoid getting lost in transaction. Probably the hard spot after lunch. Um, I hope you enjoy GofferCon so far. I did, that's what I saw so far. So um, happy that you're here. Um, I wanna just kick that off by one, let's say, arbitrary problem around consistency, which we currently see quite a lot, or I saw quite a lot with, uh, with uh, different customers, different products. Assume you have some kind of messaging system. Let's assume RabbitMQ for, for the moment, but it could be anything, could be Kafka or whatever. Um, then you build a service, which probably does some business logic, does something useful, and probably writes to a database um, for doing that. And then let's assume you wanna send a response on Rabbit, and you probably wanna emit a couple of other events onto the bus as well as part of that business logic where you tell the world, hey, I did something. So that's not a, tip, not a really untypical um, thing to do, actually. Um, if you do that, it's actually not that easy as it sounds to get that in a consistent state. So let's assume you receive the message, you do the business logic, um, then you probably have to think about, do I commit the transaction in the database now or not? If you probably commit it, um, then your, your service can crash and you probably never send the response message. If you wait um, with a commit until you send the response message, um, probably you send the response message to Rabbit, you, you, you made that call, and then it crashes before you commit the transaction because that's not a transactional thing here. You can't do a joint transaction here. Um, so that leaves you in a state where you send out a message and never did the business logic. That's not, not so nice. In, and if you send out additional events, it just gets more complicated. So that's a very easy and very common scenario, and we already can see that it's not so easy to reach consistency here. There, there's an idea, and I'm not sure how many people um, here heard about two-phase commit. XR, I always check that. Who uses that in production? <laughs> One and a half, no, nobody. Wow, okay. Uh, normally it's like one or two people, one or two brave people doing that, but half of the people heard of it. So two-phase commit, the idea is simple. You have kind of a resource manager and transaction manager basically, and you can do joint resources of different things. So you could use your database and Rabbit in one transaction by using that transaction coordinator. It goes on in different phases. So I don't want to explain that in detail actually. Um, the thing is, uh, it doesn't work. Um, the <laughs> That's, that's why I'm actually happy that nobody uses it. That was kind of, kind of a bit different five years ago. A lot of people thought it would work, two-phase commit, XA transactions. It was kind of the, oh, I can do that easily, but you can't. There's a good paper on that written from Pat Helland. Pat Helland is currently at Salesforce. He worked at Amazon when he wrote that. He also worked at Microsoft for, for some time. So he really works in big distributed systems. And he writes really good papers, so it's fun to read as well. So if you go for life beyond distributed transactions, then he explains very well why two-phase commit simply can't work. There just, if you boil it down, there are two reasons. The first is um, it simply doesn't scale, right? So if you extend that to a certain scale, that gets, always gets a bottleneck, or probably if you do it wrong, you can, you can get kind of a, um, locking problems. The second thing, and I think that's for, for most of us even more important, it's simply too complex. People don't understand it. And there are, there are situations where the, the transaction manager can't commit the transaction correctly, and then you have to clean it up. You have to understand that as an operator of the system. And so far, I haven't met basically anybody really understanding that. So it's, it's not a really a solution for, grow, uh, for, for real life. There are pets held quote on that. Um, so distributed transactions, from my perspective, are not an option to solve that kind of problem. If we look further, actually, that's not a new, it, it's basically not news. So I, I um, took that slide from Eric Brewer's keynote uh, from the year 2000. So that's quite old, right? 2000. Um, Eric Brewer is one of the Google guys, so um, he's, he's quite, quite deep into Google. And he already said at that point in time, we have to forfeit C and I for availability, graceful degradation, and performance. What he's referring to with C and I is ACID. You hopefully remember ACID from university. That's, um, if you do transactions, they're atomic, all or nothing, consistent, isolated from each other, and durable. If you write to a database, it should be there tomorrow. So that's, that's kind of the thing. And he already said at that point in time, if we want to write really scalable systems, then we have to let go of consistency and isolation. And I explain what that means in a, in, a, in a minute. He phrased that as base. That's an acronym that never took off, actually. So it's basically available soft state, eventual consistency. But that, that part probably took off a bit, right? We, we now know what eventual consistency is. 
or we should know, or we're probably talking about that quite a bit. If you look at it in a way, um, that's my slide on that. So if you do two things, whatever that is, right, and you can't do a joint transaction, that's just not possible, that's what Pat Helland explained pretty well, and then you do local transactions, like for your database and for Rabbit, for example. Um, these are two different local transactions, and what you make sure is that even if you have an inconsistent state in between after, trans uh, after committing the first, um, that you somehow clean up later on. And I explain how that could be done in a minute. Um, and that then it doesn't matter if that's a resource like Rabbit or if you do different microservices. That's why this really gets big nowadays. If you do two different microservices and they want to do atomic things, it's just not transactional. And so on and so forth. If you look at domain-driven design, there's there's a concept of the aggregate and so on and so forth. So that's where it's getting quite famous. <coughs> Interesting enough that doesn't violate the consistency constraint of ACID. In ACID, consistency means that your data store is always consistent. It's not null constraints, foreign keys, these kind of things. So it's really, in the data, it's consistent. That violates the isolation, because now you write something to the database, some other thread, some other service can already read that, even if you're not really done, right? Um, and that's kind of the thing we we're, we're, we're should get used to nowadays. If you look at the example from the beginning again, something um, what I see a lot of people at the moment doing uh, to solve that is actually, okay, I have my RabbitMQ, I have my service, for example, in Go, I receive the message, then I do one transaction. And then tr that transaction not only does the business logic, but a lot of people do what's called the outbox pattern, do like a separate table, a second table here in my relational database, where I can write something to do, like a job. Hey, later on I want to send the response and later on I want to emit some re events. But I don't do that now. I just write the information that I have to do it. And I can do that transactional because now I'm only talking to that one database and that can do transactions. So, and then I need like um, another job or some kind of scheduling mechanism in order to pick that up and say, hey, I wanted to send something so now I do it. And so on and so forth, right? Um, that's a pretty common pattern, actually, what I see there, the outbox pattern. If we look further, and one thing you can see very easily here as well, um, let's assume the following uh, error scenario. You did everything right here. Now you want to send the response. You sent the response to Rabbit. It's still not transactional. So you send the response, it's sent, and then you want to commit that the job is done and the service breaks at that point in time. Right? Then you, have, you don't have the knowledge that you already have sent the message. One thing you have to really look out for in these architectures is that you do retrying, because then you will resend the response. That will happen in that case. And that's something that's also very natural in distributed systems. Um, Pat Helm, again, I'm, I'm a big Pat Helm fan. He wrote another paper where he said building, or it's called building on quicksand. And there he introduced more or less a bit like Bayes from Eric Pruer, but he's better in marketing, so he named it ACID 2.0. And when he wrote the paper, 2.0 was the thing, right? That's, that's kind of the modern thing. Um, so it's ACID 2.0, and it, it stands for Associative Commutative. So that's kind of, I'm not really talking about that today, but that's kind of your service should always um, not, if possible, not rely on the ordering of messages. So if you get out of order messages, you can still work. That makes your service much more robust especially if you're running in a distributed or uh, asynchronous environment. Idempotent. Idempotent for me is one of the most important characteristics of a service actually nowadays in distributed systems. I make an example of that, but I'm not really focusing on that too much today. And distributed. And distributed is the thing we, we, can't, we can't choose today. So uh, basically everything gets distributed, right? Um, so that's the thing we have to live with. Um, yeah, that's basically math and math. Um, and for me, I always use that metaphor for distributed systems. That's also gave the, like the um, cover picture of the talk. Um, there's a small hut. The small hut, that's your one service. That's your one resource. That's where you have, where you know what your threats are doing. That's where you have asset transactions. It's cozy to be in there. You understand what's happening. But whenever you open the door, then you face that rough ocean, and that's the network. Right? And the network will do cruel things. So you probably know the policies of distributed computing. If not, you should. Um, they're on Wikipedia, so they're a thing. Um, 
And the first one is the network is reliable, right? It's a policy. Of course, the network is not reliable. I mean, if you use whatever app you want in the Wi-Fi here in the subway in London, it's like, whoa. <laughs> sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And it's, the thing is, it's also not binary. It's not it's there or not. It might just lose bits. It might do weird things. So it's, it's really a challenge to work with a network. That's a distributed system. And you can make very easy examples. Let's assume you do build two microservices like for example in Go or whatever language, um, you have the payment microservice to retrieve some money for whatever you want to offer, and then you have like another service, probably even a SaaS service somewhere, um, to charge a credit card. And then you say in the payment service, I want to charge that credit card. Now, um, as that's a remote call, um, you have to think about situations that the network is probably not available at that time when you do it, right? That's typically solved with retrying. There are a couple of frameworks around that where you can do retries. Or in the simplest case, you just, whatever, delay a bit, do a loop, and do a retry. That's probably still doable. The thing is, the first important thing to notice here, in order to be able to do retrying safely, the other service has to be idempotent. And you will always have this kind of situation. Independently of using gRPC, REST, messaging, whatever, you will have retries over there. And that means you have to recognize that. So just a very simple example. Um, if you just charge the credit card with the whatever I want to charge, that's not idempotent. You need, very often, it's about some kind of identifier. And the trick normally is to generate that identifier as early as possible. So whenever you create, you want to charge the credit card, you generate an identifier here. And if you redo the call, that's the same ID. And then this guy um, can easily detect duplicate calls. But he has to do it, and it has to be part of the interface. Okay, that's very important. Item potency is really, really important. But the thing is, that's just the first step. The next step is like, we're still in distributed systems. So there's one ca characteristic which, I, which is really ugly from my perspective about distributed systems. If you get a network error, a network exception, um, you, you have no idea which of these three scenarios just happened. So it could be that the network was broken when you tried to reach the service provider. It could be you reach the service provider, so basically your other whatever go routine there, and it blew up, the server exploded. Did it commit its transaction? You have no idea. Or probably everything worked fine and you just lost the response in the network. So all these three scenarios are possible. And you have no idea which of them just, just happened. You can do the same exercise with messaging. You send out a message, never get a response. You don't know, right? And that means, in some cases, you have to think about it. So for example, in our payment case, even if I don't reach or I get network exceptions while trying to reach the credit card service, it might be that I charge the credit card. I don't know. So I have to think about that, right? So I probably, in this case, I could, it depends on the service, the strategy, but it could be that I have to clean up or that I ask if I charge something before um, just like leaving it there. It depends a bit on the business situation. It might even be that ignoring it is kind of a good idea. With payments, it's typically not. I mean, people are not that particularly happy. Um, if you charge it and then say, hey, you don't get your order, you didn't pay, um, right? Um, that's a small, I mean, that's a very small example you can do here, but it already um, shows a couple of the problems you will run into. Um, as you have distributed systems, um, another thing you can observe typically is that it's not like the service is not there for, for um, forever, so it's, it's changing often, or you probably have a downtime of the other service of minutes or something, something like that. And in order to do the retrying or especially the cleaning up, when I now know this service was not available by charging it, um, it might also not be available when canceling it, right? And especially for canceling, it very often makes sense to probably retry it for a longer time or to make sure it happens, right? Um, and therefore, um, some of these challenges require state. Um, that's something I'm, I'm running around with a lot. Um, so I can do something like stateful retries or at least these sta stateful cancellations. Um, I always make my own um, bias transparent at that point in time. So um, my name is Ben I'm co-founder of Kamunda. We're providing an open source workflow engine. So I basically did work with 
workflow engines or state machines for more or less all my life. So over the last 15 years, I contributed to different open source workflow engines. Um, so that means when I see problems, I always look at them through the lens of state machines. Obviously, it's kind of a, that's my bias. So that's something you probably should know. Um, but what it can do, actually, and with a great success, is to use state machines or workflow engines in order to solve that. So that's already, a ver it's a very simple workflow, I do agree. Um, but it's stateful, that's what these kind of machines can do for you. And then you can configure retries, sorry. Like, even waiting there for minutes or hours. And you can do things like, hey, and if that didn't succeed, right, then I um, do uh, the cancellation, for example. And again, you can wait there until that service becomes available. And it doesn't matter if that's minutes or hours or days. You can just wait there until you get available. And the thing is, that is pretty easy to do. Um, and it adds a lot of reliability. Um, as I'm basing a couple of the next patterns upon like state machines, um, I want to give you an idea how that works, and I also give a quick live demo, at least that you understand what I mean by that and what, what kind of code you have to write in order to do that. Um, if you're familiar with DDD, that's a hexagonal architecture. I like that, actually, from how, how I think about applications. So you have your domain logic, and the domain logic is also business logic and these kind of things. And for me, these kind of workflows, they are domain logic. What should I do if I couldn't charge the credit card? That's a business decision. Can I ignore it? Can I cancel it? How do I cancel it, right? When should I send the payment failed or should I probably retry that for days or whatever? There are a couple of options there. That's the main logic. And then in order to run these kind of things, you need infrastructure like a probably databases or a workflow engine. And in this case, I want to use CB. That's an open source product. We started that uh, three, four years ago. Um, it's, we just reach a production ready state and going into production with a couple of customers. That's, um, it's very lightweight. I show that in a minute. It's open source, so you can just try it out yourself. And it's the buzzword like cloud scale. So what we, what we did there is it's an own distributed system and it scales horizontally. So you can really do a lot of load on that. You can do a lot of throughput on that, which unlocks a lot of these kind of use cases. And let's give you an idea of what I'm talking about. Um, what I have here is basically, I have, where is that here? Right, I have a so-called, I call it Stripe fake server. That's my credit card server, okay? Where I can make charges on credit cards. Then I have a very easy Go program. Is that readable in the back? Yeah? Are you interested in reading it? <laughs> it was a bit like a slow reaction. Um, <laughs> what I do there is pretty easy. I just start an HTTP server now. That's my payment service. Um, in order to handle payments here, it's not very nice code. It doesn't do fancy stuff. It basically just charges the credit card, which is do another HTTP call right, um, on, th on that other service. And then if that works, it returns um, uh, status OK, otherwise at 500. OK? That's typical code, right? Um, I hope. Otherwise, correct me. Um, so what I can do if I run that, I have it. I have REST service. Um, what I can do is I can put payments now on that service running here. Um, let's see. That works. So we see somewhere in the console, it retrieved the payment request, it does the call, and it ends up charging the credit card here, right? So I can do that for the rest of the remaining 12 minutes, right? Um, probably not so fancy, right? So and what I will do is um, I will shut down the um, service. So that could be a, whatever, a network outage, a failure, um, service outage, whatever. Um, if I do the request now, it's not too hard to guess. It should be a 500, right? Because it can't reach the other service, right? So that's the situation like where I where I'm currently am. And what I want to do is um, now I want to use um, a very easy state machine in order to change the behavior. Um, so what I have here is a very small workflow. It's a BPMN. BPMN it's an ISO standard. It's kind of a language for workflows. So that's not an invention from, from, from us or something like that. A lot of engines actually using that. And there I can say, hey, here's where it starts. Then I want to charge the credit card. And then either it's successful, then I go that path or the other. Um, I don't explain all the details. If you're interested, it's on GitHub or ask me later on. The interesting part here is charting the credit card. How is that done? And 
I will walk you through the Go code in a second. Um, what, we will, what we need to remember for later on is there's uh, a so-called task type. It's called charge credit card. And I can define retries, like how often should I retry this kind of thing, okay? Um, if I go back to the Go code, um, what you can see here, it's still starting the HTTP server that didn't change much, right? So that's more or less all the same. Um, charging the credit card will be a bit different. Um, what I now do um, in my init, to init the whole thing, is I connect to the workflow engine. In this case, that's um, so-called CB. CB is that open source project I was talking about. I started, by the way, CB in the background already. Um, I used the Docker Compose file we have online. Um, you can use Docker. You can just download a distribution and run it if you like. So that's really, really easy to get going. Then I define what we call a job worker. So here's the connection to the, to the graphics. So the charge credit card means whenever there's something to do for charge credit cards, call that handler here. And the handler is a function I um, define um, further down. I look at that in a minute. And then I get streamed the work into, into the client and execute it there. And then what I need to do also, I need to deploy that workflow file I just defined into the broker um, that it knows it. And that's more or less it. And then if I charge the credit card, um, instead of doing it directly, what I do is I start a new workflow instance of that type. So that now um, relates to um, some idea here. And that's more or less it. And then I um, have the handle charge um, method, which basically reads a couple of data from the workflow and then does the HTTP call, right? That was probably too quick for most of you. I, let's see. Uh, um, but the good thing is it's on GitHub, so you can, like in the code, you can dive later on. For me, the main goal was to give you an impression of what you have to do and how complex it might be. So if I start it up, what it does, it deployed the workflow model to my um, workflow engine in the background. Um, you have a couple of UIs. So for example, there's um, the so-called simple monitor. That's kind of for um, playing around. That's a nice tool. I can see that it just deployed my workflow. What I also see is I know don't have any running instances. As soon as I do the REST call, um, hello, um, the first thing you notice I changed 202 acceptance. So I'm not getting the 500 anymore because the workflow engine got the request and it's still trying to do it. So if I'm looking at that, I'm seeing it's currently here. And what you can also see in the background that it does the retrying, like it tries it for a couple of times um, until it reaches the limit of retries and then it, in, in my case, it goes that way. And as I haven't implemented that in the, in the small example by, um, by default, it waits there for quite long, actually, forever, more or less. Um, <laughs> why not? It's a demo. Um, if I start up my Stripe fix over again, so if everything is good, should be there in a second. Thank you, Windows. Um, <laughs> um, right. Now everything is green again, and if I refresh now, I will see that I have instances now going in the payment retrieve path. So no retrying going on. They're directly um, just moving through. And actually, what you can see if you measure, this doesn't add a lot of latency, actually. It's in the, in the really low milliseconds um, thing. So you can easily have this kind of workflow supplied. Um, that's all for the demo. I know that was really quick. So my, my goal was more or less to give you an idea so you can run that um, workflow engine, that's relatively easy, or have it as a SaaS service or whatever, um, then you can define these workflows in your domain. And then you can use that for a couple of use cases also around consistency. In my case, that was kind of either the retrying or the cleaning up and make that reliable. Right. That also gives you a, pro a, a solution, a possible solution at least, to this problem I started with. So um, at one specific customer's, uh, customer, they had exactly that problem where they had REST calls here and they had around 30,000 per second. And they had that situation and whenever you had the response, the REST call was blocking until he got that and then he returned the response. And what we could do there is, um, well, sorry, remove the animation, um, do a small workflow because then you get rid of doing all the outbox stuff yourself. You have, and with the outbox normally comes a scheduler and you have to have that scheduler, scheduler, you have to monitor it. 
And there, you basically define a small workflow where you say, hey, the first thing I do is that business logic. When it's committed, it's done. And then the workflow engine makes sure the response is sent some time later, even if it's not possible at the moment, and so on and so forth. So that's relatively um, straightforward. Good. Um, if you're looking more into all these kind of things, one, one really good book I can totally recommend is from Martin Kleppmann, da Designing Data Intensive Applications. And he also had a talk at Strange Loop. And I always like if other people are actually showing the slides, I also want to show, uh, because that adds more credibility to the thing. And he had a good slide, actually. And he said, without cross-service transactions, and that means without two-phase commit, without XA, what I said earlier on. If we don't have that, the only way of dealing with that is either we could do compensating transactions, I explain that in a second, or apologies. Apologies is the, it's a valid strategy for a lot of use cases. That means you don't um, avoid these kind of conflicts, but you recognize it probably afterwards if things go, went nuts, and you apologize for that. It's kind of like overbook a flight. Whoops, you're here, oh, that's pretty bad. Um, so for compensation, the classical example, and I use the really, if you, if you look throughout the internet, that's the example everybody uses, so I use that as well. If you book a hotel, a car and a flight for a certain trip. Um, these are different services. So if you have a problem like booking the flight, you already booked a car and a hotel, like the rental. Um, and in this case, you can't roll it back. What you have to do, you have to compensate it. That's kind of the business undo, right? You have to cancel the car and the hotel. Probably you have to pay money for it, right? Um, so this is compensation. That's the whole idea about that. And that's also very often referred to as a saga pattern. So if you do microservices, um, that's something you should definitely look up, the saga pattern. The interesting part is there are currently two approaches to implement that. And it's kind of a proxy discussion for the whole how should microservices communicate thing. Um, the one is called choreography and the other orchestration. And I want to briefly, briefly introduce that here. So, Let's assume you have a couple of these services, and they should do the trip booking. The choreographed approach would be, um, hey, there was a trip requested. This one doesn't know what happens next, but the hotel knows, oh, trip requested, I have to book a hotel, and then it emits another event, and car knows, oh, if there was a hotel booked, I should reserve a car, and so on and so forth. So that's always the receiver knows when it should do something. That's event travel, in a way, right? And so on and so forth. That's choreography. Um, and then eventually the flight is booked and my trip is booked as well, it's ready. Thing is, if you do this and you hit an error somewhere, like the flight cannot be booked, what you basically have to do, you also have to do the reverse ordering. So you basically have to know something in the car. Oh, if the flight was failed, then I have to undo the car booking or I have to whatever, cancel it, and so on and so forth. So you get basically the reverse order of the whole event chain. I always had a bad feeling about that, and I still have. I don't like this kind of architecture. It does a lot of like ping pong, or um, Phil Calando once from Meetup said at the QCon in New York this year, we ended up with a pinball machine architecture. This is a bit how it feels. And very often people say, yeah, you have to say that. You, you're the workflow guy. There's no workflow machine there. <laughs> Your product is not on the slide. Of course you hate that. And I was, I was really happy when Martin Fowler wrote a blog post. It was already 2017, so it's not latest news, but a lot of people don't get that yet. The danger is it's very easy to make nicely decoupled systems with event notification without realizing that you're losing sight of that larger scale flow. So you're not understanding what's happening and thus set yourself up for trouble in future years. I was really happy when he expressed that because that's my feeling with this kind of choreography. There are other sources as well, like for example, Dennis, he wrote, this approach can be rapidly confusing, it's difficult to track, um, so probably two to four steps are okay, but if it's a bigger thing, probably don't do that. The alternative is orchestration. Uh, yeah, and you can make very easy examples, like if you wanna change something, just change <coughs> the sequence of things. Say, hey, I wanna do this first. You have to adjust each and every service and redeploy, that's quite a mess. It always reminds me of that. That's a picture how they sell choreography to you. It's a beautiful <coughs> dance. They all know the rules of dancing. You add somebody to the dance, it will be beautiful, and it's not what I see in reality. 
Yeah, you probably already guessed that I'm, like, in general, more in favor of orchestration, but it always depends on the use case. I think there's room for both. It's, so it's, it's uh, oversimplified here. But orchestration means I have somebody really telling the hotel service to do something and wait for it and then do the next thing. So you have some coordination going on within the whole, whole thing. And then again, if you, if you follow that orchestration approach, what you can easily do, then you have one point where the flow is defined, where you can change it. And um, you could define these kind of sagas or compensation flows also within um, workflow engines. So BPMN, for example, is capable of doing that. If you look in the example, like in the, in the GitHub, I have the same thing for CV, for example, defined. If you go further and probably also want to search for other tools, you find the same example for AWS step functions, for example. That's the same thing. So um, it makes very much sense to have this kind of state in order to get these kind of sagas implemented if you're using an orchestration approach. Awesome. Um, if you're not fond of graphical models, I, will, I definitely recommend to look at it. Even if you don't like that too much, I, my, my main example for that is Clemens wrote a blog post on sagas with the same example he wrote, basically explained it in code, and that's what I get from developers all the time. Hey, we want to have code. Code tells the truth. Yeah, it does, but you don't understand it right away. This is why he put the picture up front. And the picture, it's, it's PowerPoint. It's dead the moment where he published the blog post. And with these kind of models, like you get living documentation. It's code. It runs, but it can understand. So that, for me, makes a lot of sense, and you can make a lot of fancy stuff around that. Awesome. Um, that's all I have. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much.